How does disease spread? This question has been a topic of discussion for centuries and even dates back to medieval times. However, societies have become fixated on paradigms that, despite frequently failing, claim to make disease detection easier throughout the history of health. Believe it or not, it was once believed that disease spread simply from the air being dirty. During 1832, when settlers were cutting down the forests in Mississippi, they described that when the forests are cleared away, the miasma, the noxious air is detached and disengaged. Inhaled by the new residents, it becomes the source of disease. This sentiment was also seen in Victorian London during a cholera epidemic when Edwin Chadwick, a health reformer, said that all smell is disease. Even malaria was believed to be caused by poisonous mists in medieval China and Italy. After Louis Pasteur's revolutionary discovery of germ theory in the 1850s, Western society's idea of how disease spread started to become more scientific. However, even after this monumental paradigm shift, it was still unknown that pests, insects that is, could cause or transmit disease. Of course, we now know that malaria spreads via parasites from female Anopheles mosquitoes and that cholera is a bacterial disease that typically spreads in water. But how did we come to this conclusion? How did we overcome the paradigms of the past to accept our modern approach to identifying disease transmission? How is it discovered that we can get illnesses from insects such as seen in Lyme disease or yellow fever? Well, it all began closer to home than you might expect, here in the United States. In this video, I will be discussing the story of Dr. Theobald Smith, a true pioneer in research. Dr. Smith, who was born in Albany, New York in 1859, graduated from Albany Medical College of Union University in 1883 with a medical degree and Cornell University in 1881 with a bachelor's in natural science. From 1884 to 1895, Dr. Smith worked in the Bureau of Animal Industry within the Department of Agriculture. It was here that Dr. Smith and his colleagues studied Texas cattle fever, a scourge that was responsible for the death of many cattle throughout the 1800s. It is recognized in the U.S. the cattle could spread the sickness when transported, so North Carolina even made a law restricting the movement of cattle. Determined to solve the disease, in 1888, Smith and his colleagues discovered that the protozoan named Babesia bigamina caused the disease. However, they had not found the source of transmission. Stumped, they decided to ask the community affected, farmers. The southern farmers pointed to the cattle tick as the cause of all the trouble. Unconventionally, Dr. Smith and his scientists chose to test this idea with scientific trials. This move was unlike many other scientists who often ignore the voice of the less medically and scientifically educated. Smith began this method by working with cattle. He grabbed several animals whose bodies were coated with the normal multiplicity of ticks and placed them in an enclosure occupied by a tickless herd. The sickness afflicted the latter animals roughly 30 days. He then meticulously removed by hand all the ticks on the first group, then combined the cattle with another healthy herd. This time, the sickness was completely absent. His subsequent experiment involved dispersing ticks taken from southern steers across a field. Healthy cattle led to browse in the region rapidly acquired cattle fever. Funny enough, it seemed that the farmers were right about their inclinations. Dr. Smith later collaborated with veterinarians Dr. Fred Kilborn and Dr. Cooper Curtis to ultimately discover that ticks were in fact the vectors of ta Texas cattle fever. Dr. Smith published a 301-page monograph in 1893 describing his laboratory and field research. These trials also indicated that Texas cattle fever may transmit from adults to nymphs and ticks. In 1914, the World's Work article stated that Smith had shown the way by destroying the ticks, but the ticks still ravage almost unchecked. However, the delineation of the ticks life cycle paved the way for controlling Texas cattle fever by dipping cattle solutions with arsenic and other pesticides. This tactic was shown to be above 90% effective against Texas cattle fever. This preventative method with cattle inspired the use of the first aerosol insecticide in humans. This revolutionary discovery by Smith and his colleagues that insects can in fact transmit disease demonstrates a fundamental step that changed the entire course of public health as well as medical science. Smith effectively presaged more discoveries in the next few years. Luckily for Smith, due to his efficient trials, compendious monograph, and perhaps due to being a white male, 
Smith was met with very little resistance from the global scientific community and American society with his findings. Yet, an aha moment still ensued. After Smith, other scientists began looking into other insect-borne transmission of diseases, as this was now a known possibility of transmission of disease to the world. And so, the rush to identify other insect-transmitted diseases emerged. The next few years were extremely successful with identifying other examples of insect transmission of prevalent diseases. The insect transmission of trypanomyiasis, 1895 by David Bruce, malaria, 1897 by Ronald Ross, yellow fever, 1900 by Walter Reed, and typhus, 1909 by Charles Nicoll. Scientists such as Charles Nicoll, for example, stopped focusing on other methods of transmission and tested body lice biting apes to eventually discover that body lice can spread typhus to humans. We, as in America and the West during the 1800s prior to Smith's experiments, used to believe in the spontaneous generation theory, which states that living organisms develop from non-living matter. This implied that bacterial infections are spontaneous and thus are virtually unpreventable via science. Furthermore, diseases were thought to have been from bad air called miasmas. Examples such as these portray how easily it is for basic logic and knowledge of the time can lead to a false belief system and paradigms that are widely accepted. Even after the miasma theory was debunked in 1880, germ theory prevailed and nothing was known about insect transmitted disease. Society believed that insects could not spread disease such as Texas cattle fever, and thus no measures were taken effectively against a myriad of insect-borne diseases. After Theobald Smith's findings were accepted, a paradigm shift occurred. Now we believe insects transmit diseases, and thus we can implement measures to properly mitigate and treat such diseases. So where are we now? Although diseases such as malaria do not significantly impact Americans nowadays due to the use of DDT, in the 1940s, other parts of the world are still in a constant fight with insect transmission. Anopheles stephensi, an Asian malaria mosquito, has been detected in recent years in various African countries. This could potentially disrupt the years of past treatment and control efforts in the African horn as the species is resistant to pest sprays and the species habitualizes urban areas as well as rural areas, while its eggs can withstand dry locations. Controlling insect transmission is still a hot topic of global health research and intervention today. Furthermore, in the Americas, we have had large outbreaks of the Zika virus in 2015, while Lyme disease continues to affect thousands in the United States. These are both insect vector-borne diseases. So what is the moral of the story in all of this? Should we all go to farmers for all of our medical advice from now on? Well, on a serious note, Perhaps scientists should take the voice of impacted communities of illness more seriously. The lesson I took away from this story is that the medical and scientific community needs to remain open to new ideas and methods of treatment to progress our society. However, being too accepting of seemingly scientific and medical ideas can be problematic in some instances. This is demonstrated with pseudoscience and quackery when there are false scientific approaches and assumptions without enough evidence. Thank you for listening today. I hope you enjoyed.